And while this was going on, while the vernal equinox was traversing the sign of the lion, all hell got unleashed for about a millennium or two millenniums. And when it was all over, the whole order of nature, terrestrial nature, had been altered, completely altered, and has remained altered to this day, and will more or less stay in this present state of quasi-stability until the next global catastrophe inaugurates a new balance of nature. Then the question will be, what species, what cultures, what, you know, what families and genera will survive across that transition? Of course, there's another corollary of the great work, and this is why ultimately I'm trying to present this. We have been given a legacy. We have inherited a legacy. It has to do with the last couple of sound bites I gave you on the sheet today. There is a tradition. There has been a brotherhood slash sisterhood, if you will, whose existence almost certainly goes back into the very depths of the Ice Age and has been present at the founding of modern civilization and has surfaced and resurfaced at critical times throughout our cultural history and has preserved knowledge about the great temporal cosmic cycles that are embodied in the concept of the great year that I've been talking about for several weeks now. But this tradition, which has been handed down in it, through these esoteric streams, through these occult streams, deals with one of its major components is dealing with the great time cycles and what it means for life on Earth. But it also deals with understanding the causes and the mechanisms behind these and also gives us indication as to what the appropriate response should be for our modern civilization. See, that's really what ultimately the message is about. It's not like, well, here's this factor. You now know that there's a factor. There are ongoing catastrophes. They have been part of the normal cycle of things for millions of years. And like the myth of Sisyphus, where he rolls the boulder up to the top of the hill after great trials and struggles, almost getting it to the top, then something happens and it rolls back to the bottom and he has to start all over again until the cycle is broken. In the biblical terms, it would be until the curse has been lifted. In the tales of the, of the Holy Grail, it's when the enchantment has been lifted. See, in the tales of the Holy Grail, the holy, whole point of the Holy Grail mythos is to provide the antidote to the human species on earth, to break, to lift the curse, to break the cycle. I don't know how many of you have ever immersed yourself into the, to the Grail literature. If you haven't, it's highly recommended, highly recommended. And if we proceed with this, I would be happy to do a whole presentation that I have, in fact, put together through my own immersion into the grail literature and my own interpretation of the symbology, the, the strange symbology of the grail stories. Anybody familiar with the grail story, the essence of it? Have you ever read, how many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? <laughs> well, believe it or not, there's actually a lot of truth within that, although it's so obscured under the silliness that most people would miss it. The best Hollywood rendering I think I can recall seeing was the uh, John Borman film from the early 80s on Excalibur. Anybody seen that? Yeah. Now, if you recall, they, they gave a pretty good synopsis of, of the Grail mythos. Now, if you read, the, the literature is very diverse. It all emerged from that subterranean river at about the same time the 11th and 12th century, the time of the troubadours, the time of the Cathars, the time of the Templar Knights, the time of the Gothic master builders, was also the time of the Grail masters surfacing and revealing this, unveiling this literature, this Grail literature to the world at large. And it was part of this whole, this whole opening of the, of the book of the ancient esoteric science that happened in the 11th and 12th centuries when the Gothic cathedrals were built as textbooks, as repositories of the ancient alchemical science, that's our inherited legacy from this unknown lost civilization whose roots are way back deep 
into the Pleistocene, into the Paleolithic, the, what we think of as the Old Stone Age. Well, the Grail literature was one facet of that revelation that occurred in the 11 and 1200s. And in the Grail literature, we are told specifically about events that have transpired and what humans' response to it was and how the Grail, the curse that fell over the kingdom was lifted. If you recall, when the knights set out on their quest, a great debility had descended over the land. The kingdom had fallen into a, a diseased state. It was, crops were dying in the fields. Babies were being stillborn. The sun wouldn't show for weeks and months at a time. The air was filled with a haze. Um, people were getting sick, passing away early. Um, the, the Grail literature describes that the world turned into a wasteland. And it was this wasteland that the knights set out in order to recover the Grail. And what was the Grail? What is the Holy Grail? What was it? Well, we all saw Indiana Jones, right? Okay, in Indiana Jones, what was it? The cup that Jesus drank from. It was a cup, yes. It was a cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Now, what's the connection of that with the tales of the knights and, the, and King Arthur and so forth? Well, what we're getting into here is the deepest esoteric my mysteries of original, authentic, early Christianity in which all of this stuff has been compressed in symbolic form in order to be transmitted from the dawn of the Piscean Age to the end of the Piscean Age. It's just too bad that the mysteries got taken and got corrupted to become a tool of authoritarian power structures who then went to great lengths to suppress the original truths that were in the authentic early first and second century Christianity. When the Grail literature emerged in the 11 and 1200s, it was a symbol of that lost, true Christian tradition that was symbolized by Joseph of Arimathea traveling to Great Britain, carrying sealed in the grail, in the cup, the blood of Christ. But see, if you read the biblical, biblical, biblical account, it becomes apparent that there's a deep mystery associated with the blood of Christ. Somebody asked me earlier about the Eucharist and the, the cat Roman Catholic ritual of eating the wafer that represents the flesh of the God and drinking the wine that represents the blood of the God. Well, this gets back into the, the mystery of the grail because the mystery of the grail deals with the evolutionary transformation of the human species on Earth. And as it turns out, the universal medicine, the philosopher's stone, which is the great secret of alchemy, is actually something that's delivered to Earth from outside, from the cosmic domain, and it happens to be delivered to Earth at the same time that the forces are being unleashed that trigger the great global catastrophes. So it becomes impossible, really, to study the one without studying the other. Remember I told you that when they examined those microfossils contained within the great chevrons, they found fused to those microfossils extraterrestrial metals, right? Platinum, zirconium, beryllium, titanium, exotic metals which are not native to the surface of the Earth. If they are, like in the case of titanium or platinum, they're siderophiles. They lock with iron, and the iron sinks to the core of the earth, making it non-accessible to human beings, except when it's delivered via cosmic sources. Right? Well, the alchemists knew that the raw material of the great work was nothing but these very exotic metals that had been delivered to the surface of the earth by means of the cosmic grail. The cosmic grail, you see, the grail is a symbol of a lost technology, a lost science of human transformation. But it's also the science of 
human destruction and world destruction. It is simultaneously the science of world destruction or world evolution. The same forces that can provoke the one can catalyze the other. And that's the whole essence of the Grail mythos. And so when you read that, when you immerse yourself into that symbology, and you read about the dreams of Herzeloid, about the fiery dragons in the sky, and when you read the story of Parzival, Parsifal, who is Percival, you understand that there's a play on words because Percival, the one who finds the grail and brings the grail back from which the king can drink. And do you remember, Wilbur, what was the secret of the Holy Grail? It had to be spoken by the king before he drank from the grail. What was it? The king, the king and the land are one. Yes, because back to the idea of scale and variance again. What is happening within our own biochemistry is also being reflected in the geochemistry of Earth. This is an important, important insight conveyed by the Grail story. So, Parsifal, Percival, pierce the veil, returns with the Grail. The king, King Arthur, drinks from the Grail, and he is restored. And as he is restored, the debilitate, debilitated kingdom, the wasteland, is restored. The enchantment is lifted. The curse is lifted. And if you see, if you watch the, the movie Excalibur, after he drinks the grail, his knights ride forth once again, and as they're galloping through the wasteland, you see the trees coming back to life. The blooms, the blossoms beginning to... to to spring forth because the life force has returned to the land. Because part of this lost science was the understanding that there's a resonance between the human organism and the planetary organism. And this is scale and variance again. What happened on the planetary scale can be reflected into the human scale. And what can happen on the human scale is reflected again on the planetary scale. And just like the secret that Nicholas Tesla understood, the secret of resonance, he understood that if you understood how to employ the power of resonance, you could transmit power around the entire globe. He used the secret of resonance to set up a small piston in his Colorado laboratory. He turned it on and he tuned it to the resonant frequency of the lithosphere where his piston was activated. He took it and he clamped it to a steel I-beam in his laboratory that then went into the bedrock of the earth. And he began to transmit a pulse into the earth that was tuned to a harmonic frequency of the lithosphere itself. And within a matter of minutes, the whole region began to go, become seismically active. It happened so quick, he was sitting across his laboratory. And as he was sitting there, he began to notice that things were dancing on their shelves and moving off. He leaped up, grabbed a sledgehammer, ran over and swung and hit the piston and knocked it off the I-beam. And he walked outside in the town, and the whole town had started to shake apart. And had he not stopped that, there's no telling how extreme that event would have been. But that's the power of resonance. Now, the ancients understood in their ritual work that there's a resonance frequency between the human organism and the planetary organism, they erected structures of stone and wood and clay that amplified their own frequencies like a step-up amplifier to bring them into phase with the planetary frequencies. That's the basis of the whole science. That's it right there. The whole thing is vibration manifested in waveforms. Through, and interfering waveforms creating the matrix over which the solid material world manifests. This was the ancient science. In the ancient rituals, they understood that the human organism could become a step-up transformer for the transmutation of energies. That could be, those, those energies could be stepped up to a higher frequency, or they could be stepped down to a lower frequency where they could now be utilized on the human scale. But they also understood that under the right circumstances, with the right group of people acting in concert, 
that these frequencies could be amplified and cause changes to encompass the entire planet. And that is, a big, that is the secret of the Holy Grail right there, the lost technology of resonance. But it goes much more than that, see? I mean, there are specifics. The blood. What was it about the blood that was special? It was the resonance frequency within the blood. And that's one of the great alchemical secrets, is by the introduction of certain um, homeopathically, if you will, energized exotic elements delivered to Earth from space, the human blood could be transformed. Returning us to our true state, our true state, which is a much higher state than the one we now occupy. A, a state whose echoes are, are preserved for us in stories about biblical patriarchs living for eight or nine hundred years. Just as the flood is not an allegory, neither is the tenfold increase in human lifespan an allegory. If you recall, if you read the biblical stories, they're consistent with other stories from all over the earth. After the flood, the frequency of earth changed. And you'll notice if you follow the generations after the flood, the lifespan diminishes each generation until finally it goes from six score to finally three score and ten, which is where it's been left for the last 10,000 years. With exceptions. There's, there's just enough exceptions. The man, who was it? The last century that lived to be 100 and nearly 160 years old? Well, who was it? There's been a number of them. Well, these are people by, by intent or by accident who, for some reason, had uh, either active within their own physio, in their own physiology, or from an external source, the universal medicine, which is one of the great secrets of, of alchemy, is how to take this raw material, transform it using resonance. Its, its transformation of base metals to gold is merely the test of potency. That's not the objective, is to come up with a substance, the philosopher's stone, that can transform base metals into gold. The objective is to come up with a universal medicine that can transform the human being from a base metal into a precious metal. And the transformation of lead into gold is merely, like I said, the test of potency. So there's many, many of these mysteries that have been concealed under, underground, if you will, through these underground streams for, for centuries and centuries, going back thousands of years. They were manifest in ancient Egypt. They were manifest in Samaria. We see them occurring again in the Eleusinian mysteries of ancient Greece. We see them recurring, emerging in the Zoroastrian mysteries, in the Manichaean mysteries, in the mysteries of the Cathars, in the Templar Knights. We see the Gothic builders, the Gothic initiates, embodying this lost science in the great textbooks which were the Gothic cathedrals. And that's a whole subject which I like to devote several lectures to because the science that's contained in there is so profound that it's worth spending several lectures just on that, examining the bas-reliefs and the statuary and the geometry and the astronomical alignments and the geomancy of these sacred structures. Because you see, the blueprint for the transformation of the earth has been handed down from this invisible lost civilization from 10,000, 12,000 years ago. The blueprints, okay, those blueprints are not applicable until the timing is right. You can't just go and take the blueprints and begin to manifest the holy city until the timing is appropriate. And that means the correct cosmic alignments and the correct cosmic geometries. We are now in the last phases of the last month of the great year. At the inauguration of the Age of Pisces 2,000 years ago, a whole major section of the mysteries were declassified for human consumption. Again, the tragedy was that authoritarian powers seized control of it and suppressed the science that was contained there, and then said, no, this is not about you having a direct relationship yourself with God and spiritual knowledge. This is about you 
giving obeisance unto the authoritarian church, and only through the structure of the authoritarian church can you get to these spiritual realities. And we have, as a result of that, fallen behind the cosmic timetable that's been set out for us. Because, you see, once we begin to reconstruct the past, and we look at the record of the past that we can now reconstruct back hundreds of thousands of years, one thing makes itself abundantly clear to us, and it's this. There are two modes of global functioning. The mode that we're used to, the mode that we've grown up with, the mode in which our modern history has been written. The other mode is the mode that transpires over very limited periods of time, but the energies released during that period are way beyond all of the energies taken in toto that happen over the longer spans of time intervening. So there is the gradualistic mode that we're familiar with, and then there's the catastrophic mode. Most of the changes that we see, we see reflected in the landscape around us is the consequence of the catastrophic mode. Superimposed upon that, the normal mode has kind of softened the rough edges of the great catastrophe and blanketed them with a, with a, uh, a layer of biological material, of verdure, that, that, that conceals it from us. But if we can peel back, just like we looked at that, if we peel back the surface, the story is all right there, where it's been waiting for 10,000 years. So here we are now at the end of the Piscean Age. And the point that I was getting to was simply this. We have reconstructed a very accurate climate change record that goes back a quarter of a million years. And we can see that it's punctuated that there are these intervals of quiescent time, of slow change, gradual change, and they are regularly punctuated by a series of great catastrophes. The longest period of gradualistic change, the longest period between successive catastrophes that we have seen in the climate change record of 250,000 years is the one we're in now. We have now exceeded by at least one or two millennium the length of every other period of comparable small-term changes that we have a record of going back 250,000 years. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we have to run home and lay awake all night worrying about it, but it does mean that it me needs to become part of the human paradigm. It needs to become part of our consciousness, this awareness that there's this whole other thing unfolding on this planet that we've been lulled into neglecting because we've been taught that everything happens only slowly and according to the same processes and forces that we see operating right now on a day-to-day -day basis. But what we now know is that the windows of heaven do open from time to time, and there is a cosmic influx, and when that happens, the changes accelerate to the level of catastrophe. Now, to wrap it up, a big part of what I'm interested in is recovering the lost knowledge, the lost science, and making it available to as many people as possible on every level, from scientists and academics to artists to musicians to writers to poets to just anybody, working people, anybody, because, again, it's like the hundred monkey principle. I figure I'm not the only one out there that's making these discoveries. I figure there's a handful of us around the planet. I've just been on it for 35 years, and I've been on it very vigorously for 35 years. It's been my obsession for 35 years. And that's why I perhaps at this point have taken it a little farther than most people have. Because a lot of this information wasn't even available two generations ago. You know, we're in a unique perspective now. It's because we have access to information that essentially no generation before our own, but the present one, had access to. You know, we, they couldn't see those chevrons on the side of Madagascar. They had no way of looking at the bottom of the Indian Ocean even 30 years ago to see that there was an 18-mile hole there. All we had was essentially the legacy of the past, the great epic stories that have been handed down for thousands of years, sometimes at great cost and great effort to reach the future. So that we, who are at the close, when the great when the cycle comes around and we approach the noble point of the great year, we 
the present race of humans on this planet will have access to that lost legacy of those who have walked this planet for 200,000 years before us and have the benefit of their experience and their wisdom. And it will happen as long as the political powers that now basically control the avenues of information don't stand in the way and block up the hall, so to speak. That's going to be that's going to be really, I think, the biggest obstacle. And really, the art form is going to be how can we work within the existing power structures to bring this awareness to humanity in general, without having them react the way power structures always have through history, through repression and trying to suppress knowledge and suppress truth and suppress freedom. Because I think once, once we have removed the straitjackets, the political straitjackets from human beings, our potential to recreate this world is infinite. But right now, the biggest obstacle is archaic, old age political structures who have long outlived their usefulness. And now they're just the ossified remains of this old, decrepit system that can't be trashed soon enough for the benefit of our planet and every living thing on it. And with that, I'm going to end for tonight. <laughs> Anybody interested in doing field trips, please let me know. We're trying to plan some for the next three to six months, even one next month, if we can pull it off. The one next month, oh, by the way, would be out exploring one of North America's most mysterious lost civilizations, the Chacoan culture, out in the four corners area. He built an incredible 35,000 square mile instrument of resonance in the desert. And it's only been uncovered in the last five to 10 years, and I want to go out and explore it, map it, and be one of the first. So anybody who thinks they might want to figure out how to get involved in that, talk to me or Greg.